Welcome to today's virtual digital economy seminar. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you and uh, to continue this series with yet another fantastic speaker today. Our moderator will be Tobias Kretschmer at the University of Munich, and uh, he'll introduce our exciting guest in a, in a second. Just, uh, just two organizational points. If you have any clarifying questions throughout the talk, please send these to Tobias in the chat window and he will unmute you so you can ask a question. Um, if you prefer, you can of course also ask Tobias to ask the question for you. We'll collect questions for the Q&A after the talk in the same way, so don't hesitate to send along questions to Tobias at any point. Um, and as always, the session will be recorded and we'll make it available on YouTube. So if you do ask a question yourself, you will also appear in the recording. All right, very happy to hand over to Tobias. Awesome, thanks very much, uh, Hannes, and uh, welcome everyone for uh, tuning in. And um, I'm, I'm super happy to uh, welcome Aya. So in a sense, there's a, there's a circle closing here because the first uh, virtual seminar that I gave uh, before you know, any of us knew about COVID and, and these silly things um, was at Cornell um, and Aya introduced me there. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, I now get to reciprocate. Um, <clears throat> so Aya is a professor at uh, Cornell. Um, so a, uh, she's area coordinator for the strategy and business economics unit. Um, and basically, you know, if you don't know Aya, then uh, you should definitely check out her uh, list of uh, list of papers and list of research projects. I think it's uh, it's it's amazing. So you've sort of started out um, looking at standards and standard setting uh, organizations, and then over time, um, I think as these uh, these settings became more and more uh, digital, um, you started incorporating uh, digital or work on digital industries and so on. I'm also almost certain that your very latest publication is a co-authored one with uh, myself and uh, Renita and Melissa Schilling. Um, it's an overview article on uh, the uh, strategic implications of platform ecosystems as a meta organization. So uh, we've worked together on a special issue in SMJ, which was a lot of uh, fun. Um, but you know, I could I could talk about you all day long. Um, but really, we want to hear you talk about um, discovering firm's data strategies. And um, without further ado, therefore, I give the, the virtual floor to you, Aya, and uh, take it away. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to join you in this seminar. I've enjoyed the, the sessions that I've been able to, able to attend. It's a great group and a great community. I'm really pleased to, to um, talk about some evolving and ongoing early stage work uh, on data strategies. Uh, this is joined with um, Barzan Borumand and Gurnita Vasudeva, both from University of Minnesota. And it's really, I, I wanna emphasize that I, I would love to hear your questions, comments, um, issues, feedback, because it is really early stage. And this is the first presentation outside of Cornell that I'm making on for this paper and it's uh, not finished. So it's one of those topics where I, I committed to presenting this a couple of months ago. And yeah, it will be ready by, late November, but here we go. Pandemic productivity is not exactly what, what you expect. But I'm very pleased to talk about this and, and all the more opportunities um, for you to, to shape and, and uh, comment on it. So data strategies and topic modeling are the, are the key terms here. Um, it's really kind of trying to address that, that huge phenomenon that we're, we're <clears throat> witnessing around big data. And this has been going on for for several years or a couple of decades maybe um, by now, the, the incredible ac acceleration of data storage and, and attention to data as, a, as some kind of a perhaps productive, perhaps not productive asset of firms. So this continues, as you can see in this uh, chart from Cisco, the, the kind of acceleration just keeps, keeps on giving and keeps going. Uh, there's a lot of data in the world and a lot of it is stored by, by private companies in their, in their systems um, and it's costly. So they pay to store even though cost of storage is declining, but still that's an investment in something. But what is it, what are they investing in? We don't really know what the returns on data are. What is the value of data from firm perspective or more kind of globally from policy perspective? Um, 
how should we think about data as a, as a source of long-term productivity gains or economic growth and development and so on. So if you ask um, managers, what's the value of data, they, they start kind of wringing their hands just like I'm doing right now and, and, and um, resort to all sorts of complicated explanations of how you have to transform data and you have to, you have to manipulate it and do all sorts of tricks and acrobatics in order to actually squeeze value out of data. So it becomes a much more complicated story and perhaps variable across industries and companies. So we don't really know because um, we can't measure, we can't track data, we don't really know what the value of data is and how we should be thinking about it. So that's been a kind of a lo longer standing interest of mine and it has taken me a long time to figure out how we can even start to, to sort of in some systematic way to assess um, what's the value or what are the implications, strategic implications of data um, that, that companies are holding. And even accountants are, are on this uh, topic. So this is from a recent uh, CPA, so Certified Public Accountants Journal. Um, data reflects the characteristics of financial reportable asset because it has a probable future economic benefit. So there is that potential, but it has to be processed and converted into information through some procedure. It can help improve operations, revenue, relationships, quality, all sorts of things may flow out of um, these kinds of data procedures if you do them well, but few firms have actually learned to manage their data as an asset to derive the most value from it. So that's sort of where we are with this. Um, and that's really our, our question in this project. So do can we pinpoint what data strategies are? And do they actually enable some sort of competitive differentiation? Can data be the basis of competitive advantage? And can we measure that in a, in a kind of a more representative and a systematic way? So my data strategies facilitate innovation, process improvements, efficiency. Um, and in this paper, we start from a slightly smaller set of questions around um, mitigating risk and particularly looking at IT outsourcing types of um, strategies. So how do data strategies evolve? How do they involve substantial investments? So do we actually see if people seem to be engaging in some kind of data strategy, does that then correspond to some kinds of monetary expenditure? And then uh, does it then correlate with long-term performance implications? Um, just a, one more thing before I, I'll, I'll break for um, questions and comments if there are any. So what are these data strategies? Just wanna put some some definitions out there. Lots of managers are wondering, there's a, there's a huge literature if you look in the popular press around uh, data strategies. Um, we describe, so we focus on data resources that are sort of observational data, not substantially processed, manipulated or analyzed. And um, usually they come from social scientific production or some, some other processes that the firm observes or, or um, uh, runs, operates. And then the strategies are how these data resources are deployed to, in, with the intent of enhancing competitive advantage. So that's, that's our definition of data strategies for now. And we'll try to measure data strategies with a topic modeling approach uh, from uh, focusing on 10K reports or annual reports of companies. Uh, we look at what influences can we identify events that influence how those data strategies are shaped. Uh, focusing particularly on um, resp firm responses to GDPR and also industry uh, breaches within their industry. And then um, how data strategies um, impact firm performance. So looking at then subsequent um, um, aspects of uh, operational and, and other forms of performance. So that's where we're going um, with this. Can I, do I have, um, any questions at this point before going into more details? Anybody? All good. So, so I, I have a maybe naive question, um, but couldn't you also make a case that um, if we're all using the same technology, um, i.e. we're using sort of data and AI to try and change or to try and uh, adjust our strategies, that eventually um, it might not be, or it might be a, a source of competitive homogeneity rather than competitive advantage? 
Sure, if they are also willing. Not, oh, there's a loop. Um, it might I mean there might be opportunities to, um, let's say that there might be other technologies that companies are using for in their products and then enhancing that with data might create new complementarities, new combinations of, of um, products and, and services. So um, plus those technologies are, I'm not moving enough in my house, it's not lights back on. Um, those technologies are still evolving fairly rapidly. So there's also opportunities for, for just innovation in the technologies of taking advantage of data. Plus uh, firms have access to different kind of um, internal data sources. So those might also lead to differentiation. Thank you for the question. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, so going ahead. So we are sort of starting with the idea that, that or with a perspective into data of attention. So attention to data. And I'll, that relates to our choice of uh, using data, um, using firm disclosures um, as our, our basis of research. So there's a whole literature in management called attention-based view of the firm, um, which, which kind of looks at the, what do organizations actually pay attention to that leads to the, how they define the strategic agenda. And if things are not on the agenda, they don't get done. So in order to allocate resources pursue some strategic actions. Um, um, managers in the firm, usually it's focused on top, top management teams, have to be paying attention to the issue. Um, and so, so we're, we're kind of starting from that idea that attention is necessary for action. Uh, we bring that to the data context and, and argue that top management attention to data risks has to precede actions to address them. And so focusing on risks related to data breaches and security, risks related to privacy, especially after these new regulations. There might be also risks related to governing outsource as third party service provision related to data. And um, perhaps there are also risks of product market um, opportunities related to data. And so um, we kind of bring start sort of uh, as a, our foundation for conceptually addressing this question of uh, how do we use this text, text-based data um, for our research, we kind of start from the idea that there has to be attention in order for action to, to follow. So um, using 10K texts, annual reports, um, we're not the first ones to, to invent this. There's actually a, a whole literature in, in finance, particularly accounting a little bit too but also kind of coming into um, uh, strategy and economics gradually, looking at what we can learn, how we can systemat systematically analyze and organize information from 10K disclosures to, to understand what firms are trying to uh, pursue in their, in their competitive actions. So 10K reports are, we're looking at uh, US-based companies and it's governed by the the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. There's a whole kind of stream of legislation that requires publicly traded firms to, to disclose these reports annually. And there's quarterly reports that they have, have to also do, but the annual report is the most comprehensive release of information. They are audited. They have to disclose issues that have material impact on performance and they're legally binding documents. So firms, typically don't want to disclose anything if they don't have to, but they are required to disclose something. Um, there's costs to disclosing false information. So probably everything that's in the report is accurate and to the best of the knowledge of the uh, management team. Um, and they are, if they don't disclose things, particularly risks that might affect their stock performance down the road, they may be liable personally and, and uh, as a company. So. So the, I think there's, a, there's emerging consensus in the literature that's using these texts that, or these documents that, that the information is valid and does correlate with product market activities, uh, competition, and other kind of strategic behaviors. So there's that um, Hoberg and Phillips work, which has really been a kind of a pioneer in this area. They um, use 10K reports to 
to look at product market de definition. So basically how competition plays out in product markets can be derived from 10K reports. Closer to what we're interested in, there's a, a couple of really neat papers in the information systems literature. Um, Wang, Kanan, and Almer looked at data risk factors, the same risk factors that we're, we're interested in, and then how they correlated with breaches and, and stock price uh, prices of companies. And then a little more recently, Saunders and Tambe had a paper looking at data assets and practices as, as um, we do and um, implications or, or correlations with token skew. Both of those papers though don't do um, topic modeling, they do sort of word counting exercises of different nature. So they have sort of earlier stages of um, uh, sophistication in terms of text analysis. So we build on both of these papers in, in our work. And we also look at the, specifically at the effect on GDPR and, and there's now a, a larger and growing literature around uh, in, effects of GDPR, including papers by, by Tobias and, and uh, Christian. Um, we, there's a, a whole bunch of mostly unpublished papers. So GDPR has an effect on, on venture finance and, and market concentration and internet interconnection, app innovation, and so on, data sharing, and will relate GDPR in this paper to data risks. And it, particularly attention to data risks. So building on some really great um, antecedents in our paper. So um, the papers by Saunders and, and Tambe and also the Wang paper were looking particularly at privacy and security issues. That's a, obviously a core, core issue and challenge in, in information systems. So we look at those, but we also kind of bring in two other areas of data strategy as a sort of exploring new angles into what firms may be doing with data or in markets for data. Um, so one is the third party data service um, question related to IT outsourcing, cloud, cloud computing, data hosting, where uh, companies um, use services provided by external parties um, to host their data, host their computing and so on, which lowers typically lowers fixed costs and, and business risks, makes it easier to scale, but at the same time, there's control issues and security over the security features and, and system interfaces of those outsourced systems. And the idea is that the regulatory push for, for greater data control, GDPR, should um, kind of force attention on these third, third party service providers and, and agreements, potentially um, imposing new security processes on those activities and then should be visible in the cost of operations and operating profits down the line. We also look at really kind of in a preliminary fashion at data related product or service activities, perhaps innovation. So customer insights from data might be um, helpful for product design, customization, it might be also data management products themselves, so technologies used to analyze data that might be um, kind of area of innovation for companies. So very different kinds of kinds of uh, data strategies here. The latter um, we expect not to be really connected with the uh, uh, GDPR and the kind of security issues in the in the broader environment. So these are our pre preliminary hypotheses. Um, Regulatory change and industry breaches should influence, um, increase attention to data risks. And then the attention to data risks should increase cost of operation. It's expensive to implement more secure, more um, kind of a controlled data environment. But at, at the same time, if companies manage to do it right, it might enhance their operating profits, particularly if they optimize the use of third party services in that environment. Okay, so that's sort of, we're looking at this in two stages, external events influencing attention to data risks, and then um, second stage, looking at the effects of um, attention to data risks on operations and performance. Eventually it will become a, a fuller, fuller econometric model uh, that incorporates everything.
Yeah. Yes. Uh, I have a quick um, question. I think for um, for a number of other risks, firms can um, whatever they call it, they can put aside reserves of some sort, um, like anticipated write-offs or something like that. Um, is that something you can observe too? Um, That's a good question. So would there be some sort of accounting um, procedure that would help them guard against security risks, for example. I'm not aware of that, but that's definitely something to think about. Um, so I, I think, think one, go ahead. I think, I think there is. Um, so at least I've, I've heard it a few times that um, uh, when, you know, basically when, when firms need to make sure that, you know, they, they uh, clean their accounts in some ways, then they can um, they can resolve some of these risks or some of these reserves that they put up um, for uh, for certain risk because they said now the likelihood of that risk happening is is gone or is uh, is is very small. So I I would guess it's a line item somewhere um, okay. that you may find. I'll have to look into that. I was not aware of that, but that's a really interesting idea. If we can see something like that ballooning suddenly as a response to to some of these. There's, a, there's another question by Stefan Wagner. Do you want to pose it yourself? Uh, yeah, Stefan's a... Stefan's here. Stefan's here and he's a courageous guy. Um, I just need to find him. Um, I'm yes. so far away that I can't bite anyone, so please don't talk to me. So I'm trying to unmute him. Um, okay. But, uh, I think now it should work. Cool. Just a very quick question. So I was just wondering whether there is a chance of, of I, I called it data washing in the chat, like greenwashing or whitewashing in company reporting that, or in the sense that, is there a chance that companies have an incentive to overstate their attention to data in, in, in their reporting? I mean, I can imagine situations where they just write, look, we implemented all those cybersecurity things or whatever you have in mind when it comes to data and we are complying to everything where in reality, they haven't done anything, but it's just there because the regulators want to see it. So, and, and I wonder what, what that implies for, for, for what you're going to present now as the talk evolves. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's definitely sort of something that comes to mind quite quickly that maybe they just uh, put out words. To, I mean, they'll cover their bases and it's there. And if something bad happens, they even if they don't actually invest in anything, changing real proce uh, procedures of uh, data processes um, that sort of just hedges their bets. Oh, well, we knew that that risk existed and, and we um, told you about it. So that's a possibility. Um, in, they should report things and, and um, issues that they think could materially impact their business. And so if we're looking at things, so we're looking at things within firm and that, so it's the same firm that's adding or detracting words and, and statements in their disclosures um, in response to something that happens in the environment. So it's, it's possible that they just add just in case. And uh, that's something to explore. Does, does that so something we want to look into? Does the changes in the wordings, does it actually correspond to changes in um, investments or in operations? Stefan, do you want to jump back in? Yes, yeah, so, so, so as I related, that, that, that the follow on question just comes to my mind as, 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 as we speak. So, I mean, since probably a, a lot of auditor influences in the formulation of those filings, I just wonder whether it might, might be worthwhile looking in, in correlations amongst auditing firms. I assume a lot of the work is done by the big four auditing companies and you might find correlations across who, who, is, who is consulted by which of those different auditing firms, I would suspect that KPMG is using this similar formulations for all of the clients. And that, that, that might also be something that, that needs to be eliminated from those analysis that follow. Yeah, that's a good point. That's actually interesting and, and doable, I think, because there are so few firms out there, or so, so few major firms. Um, and we also, also had an idea, which we haven't implemented yet, of trying to somehow uh, detract or identify the templates. So if there's a sort of a GDPR standard template, so if we could sort of account for that, put it aside and then look at um, 
beyond that statements that go beyond the, the standard template. So that will be that will be uh, interesting to do. Thank you. That's a great idea. Looking into the audit auditing firms. Anything else um, at this point? I'll uh, all good. I'll jump to the to the implementation. Um, so topic modeling, if you're not familiar with that, it's a sort of a glorified cluster analysis of words. <laughs> um, it, we were using the basic Latin Dirichlet allocation model, which looks for co-occurrences of words in documents. And for us, a document is a paragraph in a firm's uh, 10K report. And I'll explain how that then gets aggregated up. But there's, a, there's an assumption that there's an underlying topic structure that generates these, these words. And we're trying to identify what the firm was talking about when they were putting these words in that paragraph. So each paragraph will sort of, we, we focus on paragraphs that have the word data in them. So that's the starting point. Does it have data? If it, if it has data, then what other words also show up there and how those firms, uh, those words cluster um, within across paragraphs. And so that's um, the illustration here is trying to trying to show that each paragraph may have all the topics or multiple topics, but it might have a, a more concentration in a particular topic area. And then we aggregate the, the topics per firm per year. So um, that's more or less how topic modeling happens. So we take Item one and one A, which is the business description and the risk factors from the 10K report for a particular year for a particular firm. We take the paragraphs that have the word data in them, clean the paragraph a little bit, then um, have a corpus of documents that each paragraph is a document. And then we actually do the analysis on those paragraphs with the LDA um, topic modeling method adjust numbers of topics and uh, look at the coherence score. And Farzam did all this um, in a very um, impressive manner, um, but I won't be able to answer questions about specifics. So uh, hedging my bets here, my risks. Um, creating topic measures for each paragraph. So right, so each paragraph then gets a measure of how, how many topics were there and which those topics were about, uh, which, which those topics um, correspond to in the, in the whole set of documents and then aggregate measures to a firm year level from those paragraphs. So that's basically the procedure for creating the data, attention to data strategies, um, measures. So this is what it looks like. There's eight main topics. Topic zero is basically about financial data in the 10K itself. So it doesn't really contain, we don't think it contains relevant information for our um, research, but the other topics are more interesting. Um, particularly topic three seems to be about data and security. There's a lot of words related to uh, breach, privacy, security breach, and so on. Topic four seems to be um, particularly about privacy. Um, so privacy appears in, in both of these fairly frequently. It has, uh, topic four has also the regulation and law, legal angle, protection and consumer. So a lot related to personal data protections. Topic six has the word third party and third party in it, um, customer information, security services and so on. So those are, um, seem to be kind of related to managing data risk or potentially related. Um, and then there's the topic two, which is, looks very different. It has words like database, application, software, system, product, service, client. So clearly it's more market uh, facing. Um, it's about either data products or data uh, systems or data products. So we don't know exactly what kinds of products this is talking about for different firms, but it has a product and market orientation. So con contrasting against these more risk oriented data strategies. So we'll focus on, on these topics and these kind of uh, areas of attention in those 10K reports. Uh, here's just really briefly some sample paragraphs so that you get a flavor for what this looks like. So here's an example of a paragraph with security words. Um, if our privacy or data security measures fail to comply, uh, there's a potential loss of business and there's a lot of 
the wording about the regulatory changes. Here's a couple of other statements. Third parties, they might say, we rely on third party systems and technology uh, because we don't control the processing of data uh, on the servers at third party technology providers. And so they control and we might have some risks. And then the data management or system products um, strategy ha might have something like this one. I don't know if this is for Oracle, but talking about database software products, customer requirements, data management applications. So um, very different kind of um, topics in this paragraph. Okay, just for illustration, here's uh, here are the data strategies of Facebook. So you can see that I think that sort of dark green is the data privacy um, topic. It's been growing over time and it's really the dominant issue, data issue for Facebook. Here's MasterCard, which also has some privacy uh, concerns, but um, more evenly um, interested also in security and um, third party data service providers. A couple of more, if you're curious, here's Amazon privacy, but also data infrastructure and communication systems. And then health services. It's not at all about, or much less, not at all, but much less about privacy and more uh, about system failure, the uh, concern with their systems actually, actually being up and running when needed. So <clears throat> different industries um, have, and different types of companies have different concerns. At least we have variation. So not everyone is just putting the same templates into, into the 10 case. So GDPR, preaching to the choir, I think everyone now knows by heart what GDPR is and was about. Um, just to remind you that it, uh, the regulation was kind of entered into force in 2016 and then fully um, uh, required, com compliance was required since May 2018. Very tough privacy and security law. And only in Europe. Um, and this is how companies might comments on GDPR uh, and its um, implications for their privacy risks. It's a stringent operational requirement for processors and controllers of personal data. Higher standards um, have to demonstrate that you have valid consent, pen penalties, significant penalties for non-compliance and so on. So um, companies definitely um, uh, address this very explicitly and, and uh, in lots of words. Okay, so let's look at the at the at the empirical empirical analysis then. Um, unless there's anyone wanting to jump in right now. No, nothing in the chat. All good. Okay, so we look at this, as I said, we're looking at it in two stages for now, just to get some kind of a feel for the data. Um, so estimating the attention to a particular data strategy uh, with that difference in difference as far as GDPR implementation. So post GDPR, whether the company was um, had operations in the EU and then the interaction term for the, for the main effect. We also look at a bunch of, there's control variables and, and um, industry breaches as uh, potential drivers of, of uh, attention to data strategies and it's a fixed effect model just really standard standard fixed effect and then um, the second set of estimations around the economic implications so again fixed effects models of some economic outcome or or implication cost or profit looking at all those data strategies and how they correlate with within firm um, financials Okay, we do this in a matched setting for the EU um, GDPR treatment. So we have um, uh, about, about 600 um, firms, um, 128 of them have operations in the EU. We focus on five, um, well, really four different industry, industry areas, retail, information, finance, and healthcare, because those are more likely to have to hold data and uh, be 
based uh, at least some other products um, own data. Um, controlling for size, profitability, and uh, breaches in the industry, we think the, the matched samples are reasonably close. The treated firms are slightly larger and slightly more profitable. So, Aya, Aya, yes, Aya. yes. There is a question by Paul Hünemund, and let me try to find him so I can unmute him. I found him and I've unmuted him. Aya, right. great, thanks. Uh, uh, I have for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering in, in these reports, is there also information on what they do with the data, in particular, you know, uh, methods maybe of analyzing? I'm thinking about A B testing, which is very hot in the tech industry, right? Could you figure that out in the data? Uh, whether the companies are doing, using yeah. certain methods. These kind of um, technologies. I don't think we see really much detail about that. So, so they, they talk about how the how issues will affect their performance in the market. So data or um, strategic arrangements for outsourcing or whatever it is. So they don't really go into much detail. I don't think we had the word experimentation, for example, in the um, in the main analysis or even didn't pop up as a as a key part of any topic. It would, be, it would be great if we were able to pinpoint spe uh, specific technologies and, and look at those. Um, yeah, particularly because that's an avenue to towards differentiation, right? So yeah. That's what, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I've only, or we've only started to really delve into the more the kind of product aspect of these data strategies. We started from the, the um, privacy and security risks because that's sort of an area that, that has been studied and we can build off of something and, and compare against benchmark against. Um, but we, there's a lot we can do, I think, more with the, the more product and market oriented uh, strategies that might give us a better idea of whether it's technological um, products, whether it's data, actual data products or whether it's some kind of services that are based on data. So I think there's a lot to be, to be um, pushed further in that, in that side. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, you, have, you have about seven to eight minutes. Yeah, perfectly. Uh, approaching the end, the punchline. So how can we explain attention to data by um, American companies? Well, it does correlate with size and, and R&D intensity or R&D investments. So tend to be larger and, and more R&D focused firms. Um, Industry breaches, um, so breaches in the industry of the company explain attention to privacy. But it's interesting that the firm's own breaches in the past, or looking at cumulative breaches, it's a rare event. Um, they don't, that doesn't seem to be triggering a lot of attention, but it might be too rare. It's just hard to, hard to estimate the impact of that. Um, but definitely industry bre breaches have some impact on privacy, att attention to privacy. And then there's the GDPR implementation for firms that have operations in the EU. That does lead to a lot of words around privacy and quite a few around security uh, for those firms. And also um, sort, of, sort of significantly um, around the third party strategy. So, so after GDPR, companies that have EU operations were more likely to be concerned about risks um, coming out of their IT outsourcing activities. So neither of these external events, breaches or GDPR had any impact on these, the strategy that's concerned with data products or data systems. So at least we're sort of identifying patterns in the wordings in 10 case that are reasonably related to something that happened in the external environment, but not, it, it doesn't sort of cross correlate with everything that we're identifying. So not everything about data is responding to GDPR. So I think that's good news. Um, and then looking at, oh, I see, um, this was about just highlighting that the, the effects are quite different across different, the different four different sectors. Um, unfortunately, information is the largest group that we have. Uh, finance is the second largest. So we're, Estimation is much easier in those settings, but there doesn't seem to be much of an effect um, on retail and healthcare. 
I have two two questions right now. Um, one by Chris. Um, why don't you start, and then it's uh, Michele. So um, I had just a quick question here on, on, on that slide. What is the baseline effect of GDPR? So um, that there might be some effects even for, for firms that don't have an EU presence. Um, uh, it is estimated. I think I have dropped it out of um, making this um, slide. So, um, oh no, wait, um, actually it goes into the, uh, the here dummies. So it merges with that. I actually ended up merging it with the year dummies. Mm -hmm. So if I put in year dummies okay. for other years and then GDPR, post GDPR dummy, it is um, quite large and positive. So across the board, there's a, an increase in attention to privacy and security, even for firms who are based in the US. Um, but then I didn't, yeah, ended up not putting it. Thanks. And uh, Michele Fioretti, you had a question. Should I unmute you? Okay, well, uh, uh, it's a quick question. I was wondering whether there is any impact uh, on the stock price of a firm uh, through, I don't know, investors be paying attention on uh, uh, data policy since that uh, mitigate risk or through demand, consumers be more interested on Facebook, uh, interest on privacy and so forth. Um, we didn't look at stock prices, so that's one possible outcome variable. And actually, Wang, Kanan, and Almer did um, one of their outcomes was stock price, and they did find that um, their bag of words, so their um, words, word counts related to privacy and security were correlated with um, stock price increases, I think. So there's, I think there, there may be a connection, but we just haven't looked at the, the stock market. Okay, and then there's another another question by uh, Sundar Bararwaj. I've unmuted you, I think. It's not un unmuted. So it's so slow in reacting. Uh, I... Yes. Can no. yeah. uh, Thank you for the presentation. My question is, uh, did you include marketing uh, intensity log of marketing investment as a predictor? A lot of a lot of the privacy and data concerns that are related to customer related uh, information. No. So, um, what's your your idea, your concern is, or or maybe there's a there's a strong correlation between marketing expenditures and privacy. Yeah, so you have uh, log R R R and D as 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 a, as a as an independent variable here. I yep. think marketing would be a, another potential addition. Yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, Thank I'll you. add that in. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you can go on, Aya. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so that was um, just highlighting that the 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 effects are variable across sectors. Primarily, we see these. Um, external events influencing data, attention to data in finance and information sectors, much less on retail and um, almost nothing in healthcare, although the GDPR seems that, that might be a, an outlier of, of sorts, it looks huge, that impact is huge. Um, and possibly one, one conversation we had um, amongst the author team is that healthcare already, so GDPR may have been largely only cover, covered by the HIPAA um, regulations from earlier, so who knows. But finance and information are primarily the sectors where, where these things are happening according to our data. Okay, then just looking at the, what does this, what do these attention to strategies um, attentions to uh, data strategies uh, correlate with in terms of firms' financial investments and, and outcomes. We look at uh, cost of goods sold, and these are all service companies, so it's really cost of revenue that we're looking at. Uh, we look at log revenue and see no impact there. And we look at operating profits and, and also R&D investments here. So in terms of costs, security, uh, attention to security and attention to third parties seem to increase cost of revenue. There's um, not much 
of any impact on on revenue itself. Um, I wonder why I put that in the box for privacy and security. Um, the main impact on on oh, I, I think I wanted to just say that it seems that privacy and security are are just a drag on profits, if anything, um, not enhancing the kind of top line, whereas the attention to third parties can actually um, help um, optimize operating profits for, for companies if they do this right. Um, then throwing, this is kind of where explaining things with a log R&D and then we're explaining log R&D in, <laughs> in the next slide. So this is just throwing, kind of looking at correlations for within firm within firm activities, uh, controlling for fixed effects and a bunch of other things. So privacy and uh, the data system strategy um, seem to be positively correlated with, with um, either current or subsequent um, next year's R&D investments as well. So they, those may be reflecting some enhancements in technology and in products that, that show up in that R&D measure. So that's the performance side and the outcome side. Um, anyone have any questions about this? Because I, I just, then after that, I'll just conclude and we can open it up. Okay, so I see no questions and yeah. So why don't you conclude, Aya? Oh, yeah. Sure, so, so just um, um, what we find is that GDPR breaches do influence the, the attention that firms pay to uh, data risks in their disclosures. And then those, um, that amount of attention is correlated with, with the current or subsequent operating costs, R&D costs and, and uh, operating uh, profits. And so we see, at least we see some potential for pursuing this line of research that maybe we can identify a distinct and um, uh, things that vary across firms in systematic and strategic ways that then correlate with the, uh, their financial performance in, in, and market performance in, in um, ways that we can hypothesize about. Um, third party IT services perhaps is an interesting angle to pursue further. And we are thinking about getting additional data about firms data center agreements. So looking into some of those uh, disclosure exhibits and seeing if there are major agreements uh, or changes in the data center arrangements and then looking at uh, a little bit in more detail what that might, how, what the implications might be for, for uh, performance. Um, and then there is a, also that connection with R&D investments and particularly the data systems and products um, strategy um, being a little bit in a reasonable way or, or expected way different from the privacy and security risks and having implications for R&D. Um, I think that that might be also interesting to pursue further and maybe look at some innovation outcomes or patenting or, or subsequent, um, subsequent innovation performance outside of the, the um, 10K report itself, outside of the um, um, uh, kind of financial system. And, uh, and explore those connections further. So that's where we are and, and any additional suggestions for modeling or additional data control um, identification issues would be really, 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 really valued. Okay. Awesome, thanks very much Aya. Um, any questions? We have a time for a couple and one by Maximilian. Andres, let me just. Yes, you're unmuted, Max. Hey, um, thank you very much for your uh, interesting talk. Um, I have a question concerning your topic modeling um, and the topics. Maybe it would be interesting to get more insight into each topic. And if you show, for example, um, the posterior probabilities for each token in each topic. And um, I guess you use direct lay distributions. So the top tokens or top words should be very, like have high probabilities and the words a um, little bit more down low probabilities and using these probabilities kind of get more insights about the topics. And you could be used for the same example, EMI scores 
it's like a statistics or machine learning stuff, how you can show how each word or how important each word in each topic is and how it varies its meaning. Would be maybe interesting. Okay. So yeah, if you have a particular citation for for a yeah. methods paper for that, that, that would be really great. Like I'll pass it on to. Yeah, I can okay. send it to you. Okay. Thank you. That, that's awesome. You're welcome. So I would have uh, I would have a question um, just out of interest. Um, I mean, you said well, uh, early early you know topic analysis or or text analysis tools were basically counting words, um, and now you're doing topic modeling. Just for the fun of it, did you do it with an old approach, and did you get different results? We did start from word counting just to because. Uh, topic modeling was a, is a new technique for all of us, so we wanted to kind of get a sense of what are we what are we doing when we're running these analyses, and we did some work word counting, and it did for the most part, at least in that early stage, we didn't do the regression analysis with those, but in the early stages, we did kind of confirm that okay, so if we get these topics with these words, they tend to correlate also with um, word counts for for those words, and so yeah. We did a little bit of that just to reassure ourselves that we're not doing something completely crazy. Right. On the other hand, it would be nice if you actually did the, uh, did the regressions and showed that the topic modeling approach actually gives you more explanatory power. Yeah. Than, uh, just, just, you know, word count. That's a great idea. Um, yes, I have a question by, or a comment by uh, David Nguyen. Uh, hi, th th thanks. It's a very interesting talk. And I think um, we all know how limited data on data is. So I think any kind of uh, approach to actually start and getting out there and get something that's at the firm level and goes a bit beyond this uh, pure notion of volume, because we all know volume of data really doesn't tell us much about um, its potential economic value. Um, I was wondering, because I've done something similar using the, these uh, SEC filings, and I think um, there's another tool which is called Glass.ai. It's a it's a startup from from London. Basically, what they're doing, they're reading all the business websites uh, that are out there in the UK and in the US. So everything that's uh, written in English, I can use that basically with with a similar kind of method. They're going to look for for topics which are connected. Maybe you're aware of it, um, and basically you can use that maybe to extrapolate some of those findings, which are obviously constrained to those firms that are required to file um, with the SEC. And kind of go beyond and look, maybe look at broad industry breakdowns or something like that. Okay, um, so they are reading the website, like the front page of the website. Yeah, no, they're reading actually the entire website. So anything that's published on there, even like social media and so on. So it's, it's okay. quite- Okay, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So they have some kind of an extensive uh, crawling effort. To exactly. Scrape the yeah. data in, okay. Yeah. That's great. I. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll email you to ask about the, the company that you mentioned. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Are there any further questions, comments, complaints, gratuitous insults, anything? <laughs> um, Feel free to email me if you have, if anything else comes to mind or, or you wanna um, talk more about some specifics of the, of the work. Thank you. Cool. Aya, thank you so much. Um, this, was, uh, this was awesome. I, I really enjoyed it. And I think uh, all of us did. Um, I want to, before we all uh, break um, or before we all uh, disperse, uh, hand over to Chris, who's going to say a few words about the next seminar. So thanks again, Aya. Super interesting paper. I just wanted to quickly announce that the WIDE seminar will continue in two weeks. Our next talk will be on December the 3rd. Same place, same time. We look forward to having Kusuku Utake from Yale School of Management. And until then, looking forward to see you in two weeks. Thanks again, Aya. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. That was thanks. awesome. Great to Cheers. see everyone. Bye. Bye.